My guest today is Michael Berryman. Michael has been thrilling movie audiences for more than 40 years. He's been featured in countless film and television projects, ranging from cult horror films to Academy Award-winning dramas. Uh, Berryman is a beloved icon in the horror genre and adored by fans worldwide. He's been directed by genre legends Wes Craven, Ruggiero Diodato, uh, and Rob Zombie. He may be best known for his portrayal of the cannibal Pluto in The Hills Have Eyes. Michael's beautifully unique features make him instantly recognizable, and his presence makes every project better. He appears in two massive franchises, Star Trek and X-Files, and portrays a wide range of characters, ranging from evil, dangerous, and menacing to wise, gentle, and comedic. Whether he's playing a mutant biker in Weird Science, the devil in Highway to Heaven, the gentle giant Ellis in the masterpiece One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, or Captain Rips in Star Trek The Next Generation, audiences light up when they see him on screen. He's recently published his book, It's All Good, a memoir in my own words. It talks about his amazing perseverance through unique challenges in his youth, and that ultimately paved the way to become an icon and role model to thousands. Michael, it's a pleasure to meet you. A uh, pleasure to meet you, too. Uh, that was a great intro. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to cover some ground in this first part. Uh, your mother, Barbara Berryman, was born in Rosita, California, in the San Fernando Valley. She was a registered nurse and became president of Bay District 5 of Women's Auxiliary to the Los Angeles County Medical Association. She was also active at St. John's Hospital Medical Auxiliary, Westside Medical Wives Auxiliary, and the Scouting Women's Reserve. She was involved with fundraisers like the Leprechaun Ball for St. Martin of Tours Church, fashion shows for Santa Monica Hospital, or the annual St. John's Gift Shop Christmas fundraiser. She was also a speaker for the GEMS program that instructed teenagers on how to care for adolescents and how to handle minor emergencies while in their care. Your father, Sloan Berryman, grew up in South Pasadena. He was a member of the Boy Scouts Troop 12 and attended South Pasadena Senior High School, where he was a pressman for the Tiger School newspaper. He studied at University of South California and began his illustrious career as a renowned neurosurgeon, but first as a brain surgeon for the United States Navy. Your father was deployed on a secret mission to the fallout zone of Hiroshima in the wake of the atomic bombing. His exposure to the radiation caused a series of rare genetic conditions and health complications for you when you were born. He was stricken with polio the year after you were born and temporarily confined to an iron lung at Birmingham, Birmingham hospital. He recovered, but suffered on and off from this episode throughout his life. You were born in Los Angeles on September 4th, 1948. It was a Saturday. You required reconstructive surgery as a child, and the procedure left you blind for many days after. You lived in a modest stucco home in Culver City, where your family installed a swimming pool while you were lit, while you convalesced. You were there a year before moving to a large two-story Spanish-style house in Santa Monica. You were an altar boy and attended St. Martin of Tours in Los Angeles for grammar school. Family time included dinner at the pantry or watching television shows like Sea Hunt, The Red Skeleton Show, or The Wonderful World of Disney. Apart from your medical challenges, what were you like as a child and what was it like growing up at an early age in Culver City in Santa Monica? Uh, I just, I just want to give you a, a, a wonderful thumbs up. That was probably the best research and delivered um, intro that I've uh, ever experienced. Uh, well done. I, I compliment, I want to give you compliments uh, where they're uh, duly earned. Uh, great research. Um, Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Culver City at, at the time was just uh, not too far from the Hughes Corporation uh, um, where there was a, a meadow area. I remember driving down Lincoln Boulevard uh, going going to Daniel Freeman Hospital with my father, where he saw patients, and I appreciated the fact that it was all open fields and uh, wildflowers uh, grew there uh, year round, and there were people that would uh, just appreciate the beauty of nature, which I'm a big fan. And over time, of course, you know, LA became a, a mega mega city. So I was fortunate uh, with my family uh, growing up to see the quiet areas 
between the clusters of small towns, which turned into cities, which turned into um, 10,000 square miles of concrete jungle, which is LA today. I remember um, it was uh, just a very quiet neighborhood. The, the experience of, uh, of convalescing um, at the first home I remember, of course, which was Culver City, uh, I remember, as I explained in my memoir, what it was like to watch the excitement of a, a bulldozer making, making a big rectangle in the backyard, and bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper. And pretty soon, eventually, there was a pool, which was uh, wonderful. And for me, what I liked about that particular experience was that it, it invited uh, neighbor. We got to know our neighbors uh, in the neighborhood because they would come over and, you know, splash around with us. Soon after we uh, left Culver City, of course, we we moved uh, northwest up into the Santa Monica area, which is about maybe 20 minutes away. And we had, well, we eventually had five children, five siblings. And yes, it was a huge house, uh, <laughs> a two-story Spanish style house. I remember when we, uh, well, when our, our parents and, and friends of the family would come over and help my mother, she was very good at uh, redecorating. And there was a machine that had uh, um, live steam and it would, it, it would steam the wallpaper. Back in those days, wallpaper was very popular. And I remember my mother being excited every time there was a new layer she would tear off a piece and, you know, announce to the household, oh, look, another one. I believe the dining room had seven layers of wallpaper. Uh, now, as a child, you know, um, my, my older sister and my younger brothers, we, we would uh, judge uh, grownups by their behavior compared to what we as children, who, you know, we assumed certain things were... Uh, worth talking about, and grown-ups, of course, could be stimulated with different um, aspects of uh, uh, what's going on uh, around you. So it was pretty, uh, uh, pretty, mm, pretty quiet. The news wasn't as bombardment, uh, you know, to our senses as it is today. Uh, so I had a uh, we'd go to school. We'd uh, you know, just do the regular routine. Um, my father had an office which he would read EEGs, uh, so those little squiggly lines when they, you know, are measuring the electric uh, impulses of, of your brain. And um, he helped, uh, well, actually, well, he helped wire, uh, put together like a, <laughs> like a project, the uh, first EEG machine at St. John's Hospital and also Daniel Freeman Hospital in Culver City. And I remember he would get, he, he would just, he'd have a stack this, this thick and he would go through it and he'd make little, little comments and then he'd tear out the pages that were, that were important. And I asked him, you know, this is just a bunch of squiggly lines. Uh, why are, why are, are these pages more important than others? And then he would explain the science of it, which I've always been uh, very sharp on uh, um, science and, and, and that approach to uh, the world we live in. Uh, as a matter of fact, our neighbor right across the street from uh, our garage was our neighbor's garage, and he was a professor at UCLA. His name was Mr. Kitt, K-I-T, maybe two Ts. And he was had a hunchback and speckled glasses and um, very British. Well, he was actually Thomas Edison's lab assistant, which was fascinating because um, I, I would, uh, if I had a question in, uh, in, about a science uh, class, even up into, a, especially up into high school, science and physics, I, I, I liked those course, courses a lot. And if I had a particular query, I would go over to Mr. Kitt and I would say, here's what I'm studying. Uh, how does this work? Why is it important? How does it function? And a lot of times he would do a practical experiment where we could measure the results uh, as opposed to a, a theorem or a, uh, um, what's the word, uh, um, algorithm or calculation, 
something along those natures, that nature. I also um, had a chance to, uh, for a couple of months, one year, uh, my parents uh, said, what do you want to do for a, uh, a hobby or, 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 or an extracurricular activity? And one of them was a, um, uh, um, it was called the Science Explorers. And I would go there, I think, once a week for a few hours, and we would do uh, very small um, uh, experiments. One, for instance, was um, if you okay, if you have a you have a uh, just you know a little a post, and then you take a circle, you cut out a circle of uh, cardboard, for instance, and you stick mm -hmm. you know the stick in the middle. Now you have this uh, and the round part is flat and it, it can rotate. Well, then we were told to take um, some paper, probably uh, six inches from top to bottom and the length when you wrapped it around, it made it a circle. And then we attach that to this base. So you have this, the round flat circle, and then you have this wall that goes around. Now on the wall, we would cut out little slit slots, uh, you know, uh, the a high and yeah. about that deep, and then we would take a, a piece of a uh, piece of paper and um, uh, like put a a spear like a ball, and then every couple of inches the, the balls up here and then up here and then lower. And so what happened was the spin it, and you can view through the outside slots. And you're looking at the inside, and you can see the ball do this. So it was an early experiment of, of uh, cartoon making or uh, animation science, which uh, was uh, fascinating. So that's kind of what it was like, uh, kind of a brainiac, but uh, and, uh, not the A student. I was kind of a B student. I had friends that were, you know, geniuses. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. Um, that's awesome. That's kind of how the, our, our days were. Okay. Uh, What's Under the Bed is an interview show where I speak with horror actors and filmmakers about their biographies, careers, and explore the things that shaped what scares them. Before the influence of movies, what scared you the most as a child? Was there a ghost in the attic or a monster under the bed? I would have to say the monster under the bed it was pretty much a standard, uh, even back in early early preteen years uh we would we, we had like what seven channels on a big zenith tv sometimes with rabbit ears and tin foil and there would be the universal classics and mm. those were very popular um over time i got to meet some of those people that were who's uh, like sarah carloff for instance and others but um they were intriguing they were different they were dreamscape I, as a, as a child, we, you know, kids like to be uh, challenged about, you know, like to be scared. We don't like to, don't, don't want to be terrified, but, you know, something creepy and scary. We have dreams. And I remember, um, yes, going to the bedroom and, and getting ready to uh, jump into bed, literally jump from, you know, a few feet so, you know, the arm can't reach out and grab you. I think that's like pretty much like a, a common experience for, for children. I, I don't know anybody that hasn't had something along those lines. Um, we did did not get to the point of, you know, cutting the legs off the bed. <laughs> but um, I, I always think that, I've always felt that when something is new and uh, different, it, it you know it creates a, a quandary in our mind, and that which we don't know is kind of a uh, well. I'll do a reference from a Paul Klee painting, uh, and it's called a uh, Fear Behind the Curtain, which is kind of analogous to that to that uh, concept. You know, you're walking down the hallway, you turn the light on. Why? Well, just because. Yeah. Um, so. Um, I, I think it's just part of life. You know, something is, is, is scary. Uh, somebody goes out and adventures, let's say out in the woods or the jungle or off into the ocean. They come back and they tell their friends in the village or family and they go, well, you won't, I'm going to tell you what happened. You know, I didn't know what to expect. This is, this is what happened. And, and 
I, I survived to tell the tale. And then people write songs about you <laughs> and you become a legend, you know. So yeah, child, child, uh, child, uh, child is imagination. Uh, I'd say, I'll say childlike, because mm -hmm. uh, if you've read my book, yeah, you know the difference between childlike and childish, thanks to Sophie, <laughs> my grandmother. <laughs> Um, many kids are first introduced to horror through fairy tales and children's stories like Hansel and Gretel or Three Billy Goats Gruff. Was there a particular story that scared or excited you most as a child? I did. I was a pr pretty much an avid reader uh, as a child. And as far as uh, story tales, uh, um, all the, the, the classics, they made sense. I understood why. Mm -hmm the story went the way it did. I would have to say that with the way my mind saw things, uh, I would articulate to myself, why was there a need to, you know, dispatch the monster, you know, would the, can you, because when I had, when I had bad dreams uh, as a child, I, uh, I would do uh, uh, was a couple different choices. And one would be to try to capitulate with the, with the element that is uh, threatening and not to just, you know, not to understand them and, have, and let's do lunch, but more so um, what, what do they want? And is this, is this ter scary ride really necessary? And that was never resolved to, to my satisfaction. It was just something that it would happen, you know, and they say, well, if you eat a lot of ice cream and go to bed with too much sugar, you're going to have a bad dream. No, for me, it was more stimulation from, uh, from a scary movie. Yeah. As I, as I matured, <laughs> yeah, someday I'll do that. Uh, <laughs> as I, as I grew older, um, being aware of, of current events, for instance, uh, I would say the first event that was not from a well, I was going to say not from a film or a movie or a horror movie, but see, a lot of those were allegories, and they actually were um, uh, inspired by uh, human interaction and historical events. For instance, um, you know, splitting the atom. Uh, I was never much of a fan of that. Uh, in, in my memoir, I, I, I discuss a lot about the my philosophy as a child and and why uh, 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 why is there necessity to have armed conflict to the mm -hmm. to the point of uh, carnage death etc you know uh, um, yeah. it's been a life a lifelong uh, philosophical spiritual uh, journey for me um, I was very uh, um, uh, let's see. Um, okay, uh, roller coaster. Like there was a roller coaster at Pacific Ocean Park in Santa Monica. It was there used to be. There's a Santa Monica Pier, and then there used to be another pier about half a mile away, which was the POP Pier. And they had a roller coaster, and it was made out of wood, of course. And it would come down and then do this, but it, it would be just a few feet above the ocean. And it creaked and it and it kind of you know wiggled around and made funny noises. And um, being a, being from a, a family that was involved in, in a lot of science, um, I was always thinking about you know is this you know did they bolt it right? Did they use you know, to, you know a couple like a couple extra nuts and screws and uh, you know do they take care of the wood because it looks like it's you know, splintering or cracking, but you know, people go on a ride, they come back, everything's okay. So uh, it, it wasn't that terrifying. It was just kind of, kind of, it was a different experience, different kind of experience. Uh, there, there was also at Pacific Ocean Park the, uh, the the carousel, which you'd have to jump on when it's going slow, and then you know, you figure out uh, when you're going to get off and. If you jump, you, you have to get your feet moving quickly first, so you don't, you know, tuck and roll. But it, it was a family outing, and uh, that's something I, I think is pretty much missing these days: is family outings, uh, adventures that um, 
uh, an entire family can appreciate. Uh, I, I, I have read a lot of science fiction and I appreciate sci-fi movies because I think they're very philosophical and, and they're, they're futuristic thinkers. For instance, H.G. Wells, a uh, big fan of his work. And in my memoir, again, I mentioned his uh, anthology of short stories. And some of them are extremely poignant to the extent that I can see the concepts and, and the, the structure of the um, uh, humanity factor that is taking place amongst the various characters uh, in these stories. Uh, one, of course, is The Machine Stops, which I, I recommend uh, your viewers uh, research it, find it, if you, uh, read it, enjoy it, and, and, you know, again, reference it in my book as you'll get it from my perspective. So, um, that particular story, I, I would admit, I would say that the the people that wrote the, the well, the Wachowski brothers, the, the Matrix, and some other um, modern films, even uh, Andromeda Strain and and um, um, Soylent Green, um, these are amazing films, and I like to break them down from. You know, there's the writing, there's the musical score, there's the editing, you know, the camera work, the, 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 the structure of what's in the frame, what do you have in the frame, the tension that it causes when, a, when an object is this close to the edge versus up over here. All of those aspects are, are, are not, wait, they're not lost on, on my observational um, abilities. That's one of the reasons I, why I, I love film and I really appreciate what I've been able to do for 40 years is work with uh, artists because it's just, it's not about the actors being the, the most important, the stars, uh, more of a um, element that helps yes. the investors and producers make their money back so they can yeah. tell another story. Um, uh, uh, fame and, and all of that is, yeah, yeah, it, it's it's nice. It, it, it breaks barriers. You can strike up a conversation with a total stranger and, and 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 not get intimate with them in the sense of getting to know everything about them. But um, it, it's kind of like an ice. It breaks the ice. And everybody, whether they're an actor or not, or a musician or dancer or whatever you're doing, everybody should. Uh, appreciate that which they have within their own abilities to break the ice and be able to talk to almost anybody. Because I think a lack of communication is one of the biggest pitfalls there is in our societies, uh, not just in the United States, but globally. Um, You're up. <laughs> it's really, it's, I, all of that was really interesting. Um, the banan the banan cave was hidden is hidden by the sea during high tide along the rugged coast of Scotland between Girvan and Balantre. For decades during the 16th century, travelers and locals alike would vanish in the area. Finds of dec decaying bodies, body parts washed up on the surrounding beaches and local authorities conducted mass searches of the area in hopes to find the missing or their murderers, but with little luck. One day, a couple traveling home from a nearby fair were attacked by a score of men. The woman was killed and disemboweled mo in moments before the man was wrestled to the ground. He fought desperately against the attackers and was saved when a group of 20 more coming from the fair happened upon the gruesome scene. Word spread to King James I, who dispatched an army of 400 men and a pack of tracker dogs who led them to the Banan Cave, where they discovered a family of cannibals. What began as a man and wife 25 years earlier had grown into through incest to a family of 50 who survived by killing and eating passing travelers. The Sawney Bean clan were captured and marched to Edinburgh, Edinburgh to face punishment. The men were dismembered and left to bleed to death while the woman, women were burned alive on huge fires. No reliable evidence exists to show the story of the Sawney Bean family hap happened, but the tale remains a part of Scottish legend and provided inspiration for The Hills Have Eyes. Did you know about the Bean family before The Hills Have Eyes, or were there any urban legends or ghost stories you heard about growing up in Santa Monica? Well, uh, uh, 
first answer would be would be no. When I met Barry Kahn, Peter Locke, and Wes Craven, it was discussed from whence the story originated and what you so eloquently put put out there was uh, um, was pondered by all of us. The um, the stories of such you know behavior. Um, I'm sure I, I had heard of. Um, either through you know late night TV watching some creature features uh, uh, film or uh, just in, in, in comic books, for instance, uh, il illustrated uh, stories. Uh, um, um, there are there are places still to be discovered, so to speak. But I would have to say that when I was younger, the the world seemed to be less explored uh, there was more adventure available uh, these days um, yeah we are reaching out to the stars but I would say we're in a situation where we're cloistering ourselves to a certain degree the short story the machine stops uh, is, is a perfect example uh, of that it's a story about um, uh, a young man and woman, uh, probably I'd uh, say early 20s, for instance. And after a post apocalyptic nuclear war, of course, everybody's underground and nobody goes to the surface, and there's tunnels, and everybody has their, their cubicle. Uh, food and sustenance is provided somehow, to, you know, whether it's you know, a <laughs> soy green or soy orange or or whatever uh, those products would be for consumption. And it's a love story about uh, this, the boy works, the young man works in the archives of the historical documents. And no, nobody, it's like today, uh, if you go to a horror convention, I'll find a lot of people that have library cards and actually go to libraries and actually read books and turn pages. Um, majority of people today it's either it's on their device and you know they're walking around with these incredible uh, smartphones which uh, are quite remarkable however um, I, I still think it, uh, it it creates more um, isolation than it invites um, uh, join, joining in the, the group, kind of like what we're doing now. This is a group situation. There's people we don't see, but we know that there are people uh, listening to what what we're producing. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the like a local mom pa diner, like you mentioned, the yeah. uh, Apple Pen, very very famous place in LA. And there's another place called the Pantry which is, I think it was open in 1942 or something like that. And it's never closed. Even during the watch riots, it was open. And both of those places, uh, the food is incredibly wonderful. Okay. The apple pan is just a U-shaped uh, uh, bar. They sell incredibly delicious uh, uh, burgers and sandwiches and, and, and pie, of course. And, and, and shakes and wonderful coffee, but you, you wait your turn until there's a, a spot to sit. The pantry was the same. It was uh, very famous for wonderful dinners. And if you arrived in a, in a Rolls Royce, you, you would stand in line uh, or wait till your butler says, okay, well, we have a table, uh, which I found fascinating as a child because uh, we, we, we as children were aware of people of uh, meager means and, and then those who were you know, millionaires, for instance, and everything in between. But the fact that there was a, a qualifying um, uh, um, understanding and there was never a fight or an argument that first come, first serve, and you wait your turn. Now at the pantry, I believe it's still in existence in Los Angeles, uh, the menu is on a chalkboard. And while you're standing in line, you you figure out what you want. And when you get to your table, your, your waiter doesn't write anything down. It's all, you know, in your head. It's all by memory. And again, I see that's a tradition that was started by the people that had that restaurant. Okay, now you go to fast food places now. There's an app. You don't even have to go inside. You can, 
you, you get in your car. And again, uh, it's technology. It's, maybe it's convenient, but uh, I think it's isolating. I, 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 I really believe it's unhealthy. Um, I don't think our nervous system or our, our, um, our emotional um, network is, is designed for that. I'm sure we could adapt to that as humans are very adaptable depending upon the kind of a situation is, you know, be thrown to them. However, if you choose not to be um, uh, in, in those little mini cultural societies, uh, then I, I think it, uh, you're selling yourself short. Um, I like the mom pa diners and I'd let them know that I could go somewhere else and get worse food for less, but their food I can only get there. And uh, again, it's the neighborhood, it's the community, it's its involvement, it's the H factor, which is a big thing for me and that's humanity. Uh, if we don't see that common spark in every one of us, then uh, you don't, weren't paying attention with them when Sophie or Aunt Peggy were uh, talking to you, they're in my book. <laughs> yeah. And I invite you to get to know them. So those are certain elements that uh, um, I, I, I appreciated as, as a child. Uh, the, now, the, the McBean family, um, it's just, you would think it only happened back then. And yet, you know, these days, they're always finding something akin to that, <laughs> akin. Um, I mean, from creepy, hideous, heinous behavior like Epstein's private island or, or, or just stuff pops up every once in a while. And I think it's, yeah. it's, it's, I don't think it's done for any particular reason. It's just that the, the light is, the light is shown upon it and it's, it's, it's available for viewing. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a healthy uh, diet of, sensationalism people used to uh, like to go to the to the freak shows so to speak back in the older days of, of uh, uh, circus acts and, and what have you my sister used to say i'm going to run away and go live with the hobos well I, i've actually met uh, some people that 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 knew the hobos very well they grew up uh, um, right along the tracks in their backyard their family's home and and uh, the husband actually built a shack for the hobos, and they kept it extremely neat, and and they could they could make a meal out of nothing. And actually, the quote king of the hobos. This was in um, San Bernardino, California. Uh, a friend of mine uh, had that experience, and she said that he put his mark on building, which means. Uh, you leave it alone, you'd be respectful and everything is safe. But what she appreciated was that not only could they put a meal together with just a few scraps of this and that, and a can of this and, a, you know, something from a garden that they uh, grabbed on the way on the rails. But she said they always had great music and, and stories and songs. Well, there is culture, you see. Uh, you know, there, there's so many cliches, you know. Don't judge until you walk a mile in someone's shoes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But all of those isms, all of those little poignant tales, uh, I think um, are valuable. And uh, it's, it would be a shame if, if that activity, if, so if that behavior just vanished and it just wound up on a Google search, you know, or Surrey, what was it like back in the days when you weren't around? <laughs> As a funny aside, I, I was uh, uh, I was in I think I was in um, I want to say New Jersey. Uh, I'll say New Jersey, or maybe it was Baltimore. And I was at a convention with uh, uh, Sully Erna, who was uh, I think he's a, I think he's a drummer for uh, mm -hmm. a band. I can't think of the name right now. And uh, Joy Fatone was with us, and I I was a uh, uh, I gathered a bunch of the actors together in the lobby of the hotel and I said, let's go find a mom and pa diner or some, some cool place where the food's really good. And um, so uh, Joey 
talks to Suri and asks and starts talking to her. And I, I, I was unaware of it. I go, what, what, what's this? Or who is this? Who is this person you're talking to? And he, and he says, well, listen to this. And he, he talks to her. He goes, Suri, uh, uh, you have a lovely voice. And she says, well, thank you very much. You have a nice voice too. And he says, well, uh, we, we're going to take your advice up on, on this particular restaurant. Um, when we're done with dinner, what time do you get off work? And she goes, um, I'm, I'm always working. And he goes, oh, well, that's not fair. Let me take you out to dinner and we can go dancing. And she goes, I'm not a real girl. <laughs> and I about lost my cookies. I go, what am I listening to? And, you know, now we have uh, AI. We just had the actor strike settled. Mm -hmm. we, we came out uh, we came out with the op had to be the results of we own our image it's really you know uh, come on you know you have a yeah. you got a capture of us of our picture or previous performance now you're going to tweak it through a computer program so you don't have to pay the actors you know yeah. really how selfish are you are, are you trying to become well there there's a lot of there's a lot more involved in in, in this um situation but again it, it goes back to uh, um, emotional content I believe and yeah. a computer just can't do that and if they could uh, who would want it I mean are we that re replaceable uh, yes. so there are there are many philosophical questions that come about uh, um, in, in, in this uh, t type of a uh, conversation and uh, I encourage people to uh, to follow up on those uh, emotions emotions are can be uh, quite helpful um so actually it's been almost been 40 minutes and I'm only halfway through my questions is it okay if we go a little longer yes, than keep on yeah, we, we can roll along. okay thank you um you attended Saint Monica Catholic High School go Mariners um I was actually uh, bullied and had to switch schools. Uh, you said you had a short temper when you saw or experienced bullying in high school. Uh, thinking back, do you wish you handled it differently? And how would you advise kids my age to deal with those situations now? Well, that, that's that's a very good question because things have gotten so, well, I don't, there must be something after woke Gen X or whatever. However, when I, when I was a kid, we, um, if we misbehaved, we would get a spanking. You know, these days, ooh, they call the cops, throw your parents in jail, and then you're in a foster home or whatever. I mean, it's gotten stupid. I mean, yeah, you know, don't beat the kid for crying out loud. I'll tell you what, you get swat, get a swat with a, 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 a yardstick or a, a wooden coat hanger. It, you know, you're not being harmed. You're, you're, it could save your life if you don't change your ways, so to speak, yeah. in many ways. I... Um, I've actually done some programs for, for school districts over the years, anti-bullying, drug awareness, et cetera, um, safe houses. And um, the, honest, the honest retort I have is to, um, well, it, it, it never did me much good when somebody said, um, okay, you're, you're a good kid. They're just being mean. They don't understand. Um, and, and, and from my perspective as a child, I figured, number one, they do understand. Number two, they're doing it on purpose. Number three, they're doing it because they want to uh, make me uncomfortable. Uh, number four, they probably don't like me. And yeah, it might all be fear-based, but that's just a, a weak argument as to yeah. uh, quantify or qualify uh, why they did what they did. I, again, there's no empathy. There's no humanity. Now, uh, when um, when I would get teased, it was it was used because because my looks, obviously. But you know, the, point the finger, mommy, daddy, look at the you know scary, creepy guy. Or, or then when you get into uh, um, well, in my memoir, I talk about getting the phone call yeah. from from the bullies, which was uh, uh, not terrifying. It was just gut wrenching. You know, hey, creep, what are you doing in the school? We don't like creeps in our school. And you're a creep and yeah. blah, blah, blah. We're going to mess you up and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And, um, you know, my heart just sank. It was just, it, it, I wasn't terrified. I was, I was angry and hurt. And um, there are so many 
social issues that people are dealing with today that I think are just um, some of them I uh, I feel are, are obvious and uh, don't need to be explored. I'll leave that to your imagination. And then there are others that are that are classic, basic, um, uh, hurtful behavior. Now, uh, how do you, how do you teach a bully that uh, maybe they're not teachable? Now, I've run across people decades later after I left grammar school and um, uh, see the person, they might be in a better situation. Or if you bring it up to them, they go, oh, I'm sorry, I, I was such a jerk. You know, uh, you're going to get every kind of response. I think what helps helps the most is um, to understand the, the degree of, 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 of the issue. Now, if, if it can cause you harm, physical harm, not just necessarily emotional hurt, but uh, if you think you're at risk or there's other people involved that that would kind of you know, gang up on you or, or, or harm you, it needs to be reported uh, yeah. to someone who, uh, you know, obviously your, your, your teacher, the dean, the principal, and your parents. Um, you need to be... Um, need to be safe. I, I remember talking to, well, I had a, a, two, two friends. One was retired CIA and the other one is retired chief of police from uh, Dade County, Florida. And they were in a, a group called the Optimist Club. And we, uh, I was a speaker for many uh, school districts with, uh, with their uh, guidance. Uh, they would set it up and then I would go speak to the kids, fifth and sixth graders mostly. And some were about bullying, and some were about uh, uh, drugs, and and um, 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 if improper activity happens at home, for instance, how 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 do you report to? How, how do you be safe, and how do you not have reprisal? See, so, yeah, so a lot a lot has to be dealt with. But number one, you have to have a uh, uh, someone that you can trust. And, uh, you know, we have two ears, one mouth, so we should listen more than we speak, perhaps. However, um, um, I had a short temper. I didn't, uh, I would get in a fight. And you, you just can't go through life, you know. It's not that I, I, I'm going to kick everybody's ass, but the bottom line is um, they, they wouldn't forget that I mentioned that to them. Because in, in my book, I mentioned uh, Billy Hopkins, who had polio and, and he walked very clanky, he had braces, etc. So the long and the short of it is it needs to be um, um, needs to be discussed and you you need to share that information with those that can can help you uh, uh, be safe because when a child goes to school like the, the, there was a, an issue with a, with a school district where uh, people were, were bringing weapons to school and they said uh, how do you how do you deal with this? And so uh, I said, well, if somebody had said that the, the lockers of, of children in, in school uh, were private property and you couldn't uh, um, you couldn't search them, and I said, well, I don't think that's the case. I, I didn't think that that was the case that uh, that you couldn't search a child's locker. Mm -hmm. And uh, some parents got upset and said, well, no, you can't search their lockers. I said, well, gee, if, the, if that's how you're going to play the, play the game, then maybe uh, if they just removed all the doors on the lockers, what would happen then? And then one school actually did that. And so now items are not safe. So they wind up lugging them around in their backpack and kids were getting tired of lugging everything around in their backpack. Uh, it only happened once, to, as far as I can, as far as I know. But the point being that uh, uh, people were not being uh, were being sensible. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know there are fears that are relevant and 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 um, uh, a problem, and then there are those that are you know. Um, What's the word? Um, you're making a, a mountain out of a molehill, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. But overall, number one, safety is the most important thing, and honesty. And you know, some people you can you can befriend and say, "Hey, man, that, that, that wasn't cool, and here's why." And 
And by the way, you have a pimple on your nose, whatever. I mean, if you could break the ice a little bit, that helps, but, but you can't be, you not you're not going to be able to make friends with every single person. Yeah. So I would say move on with your life, make good choices and try to improve your life, your lot in life and uh, try to avoid uh, tools, as you say. Um, after high school, you attended California Polytechnic University in San Luis Obispo. Go Mustangs. Um, you studied botany and zoology in hopes to become a veterin veterinarian. Uh, work during this time revealed your body's limitations and employment became a struggle, whether it was working in a kitchen as a butcher or driving a delivery van overheating and your hands become a problem for you. Um, at the same time, you're finding acceptance and meeting people. You develop a passion for weight training and nutrition. You spend countless hours discovering bands at the Sane and Insane Records store and seeking out live music. Hopes for, of becoming a veterinarian uh, are dashed with the realizations your, your hands don't have the dexterity for surgery and you suffer a severe episode of heat stroke during ROTC training. What sort of student were you and how would you manage this series of ups and downs? Well, that was a lot, decades, uh, a, a lifelong situation it, it, it would never improve and they were right so um i had i had to give up on the, the, being a veterinarian number number one is that yes it didn't have the dexterity to do the, the uh, testing and and and, and the uh, procedures uh, also um, um i uh, i was uh, when you're different, when you're the odd duck, so to speak, you see people around you making progress, getting through their awkward, uh, awkward teen years and moving on, starting a family, et cetera. Well, that which was pretty much commonplace for the average person, from my perspective, was uh, a whole different life uh, that just seemed unattainable for me for, for decades, for many, 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 many years. Um, I would say it wasn't until my third, early, early to mid thirties when um, things kind of settled in. And, and yes, a, a lot of that has to do with George Powell helping me, you know, give me an opportunity to do what I do as an actor. Um, but I, I, I think the most important thing was uh, self-acceptance. Uh, I, I think that it was uh, probably the, 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 the most grounding um, qualifying um, premise and uh, some of that came about more so not with my studies and I, I didn't get my finish my degrees I ran out of money and and, and also uh, had other things on my mind but I would say going to the, the gym I always uh, um, I always liked weight training um, makes you hungry I'm a foodie so I like to you know that's why I would find a, a, you know, a good diner to eat and I just I did study nutrition uh, Cal Poly is a, a state part of the state university system um, and uh, I met people that were the most grounded when I was in 1966 1972 at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo because I, uh, it's, it's very famous for engineering, architecture, science, hard sciences, humanities, but and also especially crop science and agriculture. So I started hanging out with the Aggies, they call them, the people that, that came from uh, rural areas and grew up on ranches. And they didn't have a lot of those problems that uh, kids that came from cities had. In my memo, I talk about the Smith family and how we would go. They, they were ranchers in, in, in Fresno, California. And we'd get up at 4.30 in the morning when we'd go visit and stay with them for a week or two. We'd get up at 4.30 in the morning. The guys would go out on the Ford tractors. I'd, sometimes there'd be three of us on, on a tractor. We would one driving. I'd be one of the family members. And then either my sister or my brother and I would be sitting on the fenders of this Ford tractor. Now the tire is right there. You have to be careful. You could get hurt. And of course, these days, of course, somebody would say bad yeah, parenting. But, you know, you, you go out and about you do your, and do your thing. We would go out in the morning and, and turn the irrigation on and, and, and off at different locations so the crops would be properly uh, watered. And then after about an hour of doing that, or a little longer, we would come back to the big ranch house and uh, there would be a giant breakfast. And so 
your day starts with a healthy activity. It, it's it's uh, not physically demanding, but you're up and out of bed and you're not thinking about the news. You're not thinking about the end of the world. You're not worried about if you're gonna, if you're woke enough or you're saying the right word, it might be offensive to somebody. That All of that wasn't happening, but the other issues, you know, uh, uh, chaos, tr trouble and tribulations outside your zip code has always been a situation, but you have to let it go sometimes and do what's in front of you. It's called functioning. And uh, there's a lot of times when you go, well, I don't really feel like getting out of bed, but then you kind of force yourself and you do the best you can. <clears throat> now, that being said, I, I, I would uh, say that that was the most grounding experience. And then when I was in college, I took a couple courses in in, in um, kinesiology, you know, movement of the body and how the muscles work and, and, and our skeletal structure, et cetera. And I had uh, some... So I would, I, I, I started off with the universal machines and then you go to the freeways and the cables. I like the cables very much. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I wound up working with uh, um, other uh, uh, people in the gym that would be there at a certain time and uh, would lift w with them and spot them. And they were stronger than me, which was great because uh, they would help push you. Come on, you can do one more. We got to do it with good form. Don't cheat. No cheating. And we would watch each other for, if you don't want to cheat and get your, and, and say, cause an injury. But uh, that helped a lot. It helped my medical situation. Also, you get the endorphins and serotonin's working when you when you exercise. That was one of the th one of the precepts that I, that I would share with class classrooms, fifth and sixth graders. When I did drug programs, I would start off by saying, you know, uh, drugs are bad. However, uh, um, there's some chemical compounds. We'll call them drugs, and I want you to use them. Uh, if there was a visiting parent, they would be upset, and they go, "What well, are you telling them to use drugs?" Well, if you just wait and listen, I'll explain them. These are things that are the, uh, the byproducts of the function of you uh, exercising. And Jack Lalanne, I mean, he was a very famous gentleman on TV, and he had a morning workout program. Uh, uh, designed for housewives, <laughs> yeah, husbands away, and and, and he, he could work the whole body with just a chair. And on his birthday, he would uh, be at Alcatraz Island and have his hands and feet tied together. Um, and he would, uh, you know, bu uh, butterfly uh, kick and with a rope in his teeth, he would butterfly and he would go from Alcatraz to the shore and tow a, uh, a boat full of uh, reporters. I don't know if it was always in his teeth, but it, yeah, he, yeah, he, would, he, he would tug it all the way to shore. Cool. Now, there's been stories of people that broke out of Alcatraz and between the currents and the sharks. Um, they never made it to shore. And he would do that every year on his birthday uh, uh, up until his late 50s. It was remarkable. Uh, I mean, that was a gentleman I wish I, I, I could have met. Um, yeah. So it, it says a lot about the man now. Um, so um, I would say I slept the best, um, even when I, I got into acting and when I was living in the street in my van, um, I, I mentioned how uh, I couldn't afford rent. I'd sleep on people's couches, but I would... The, the gym, the gym on the gymnasium that I would uh, go to, it, uh, I, think it, I think it was Barrington Avenue and Wilshire Boulevard. It was a 24-hour gym, so I, I could work out anytime I wanted to and shower. And and, and then um, when my favorite little restaurant would open in the morning, I would be be there. So uh, even my friend Lou Ferrigno, I mean, he got, uh, he got, it's a lifestyle. Well, it, it, it is. Um, not every day is going to be an incredible day, but there are certain basics. You do the basics, and I think part of the basics of being healthy in your mind, spirit, and body is uh, uh, is uh, work the body because it responds and feed it. Feed it good. Don't eat. You know, study nutrition. Be smart about that. So th that's where I, I I would get grounded, and you meet good people. You know, if somebody's at the gym in the morning. Now there are people that overdo everything. You can see them; they're kind of narcissistic. But but, but the, the average person at at the gym or the golf range or archery, whatever you like to do, 
uh, have some kind of a sport that gets you outside and get you healthy. You give a wonderful account of the time between college and being discovered by the legendary producer and director, which you mentioned, who you mentioned earlier, George Powell, in your book. So I will touch on it briefly here. You were an investor in a gift shop called Govinda's Garden on Venice Beach, which was going out of business when you met George Powell, and he cast you in his movie, Doc Savage. Quick shout out to George for discovering you. You're on Doc Savage for a, a day, but leave with a SAG card. A casting director spots you, and you're cast as a lobotomized patient named Ellis in, Mil in M Milos Foreman's movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. The movie goes on to win an Academy Award for Best Picture, Director, Lead Actor, Lead Actress, and Best Screenplay. You're cast member number 13 on a call sheet next to Jack Nicholson, Louis, Fle uh, Louis Flesh Fletcher, Danny DeVito, Christopher Lloyd, and Brad Dorif. Then you're off to film 127 Days at an actual state mental hospital in Oregon. Is it true the hospital performed lobotomies while you were filming Cuckoo's Nest? Well, that's what we were told, and we got the information from orderlies that worked the night shift. Uh, it's, Salem's a real small town, and uh, we had a whole wing to ourselves to do our filming. We spent the first two weeks uh, rehearsing, uh, uh, running dialogue, camera work, lighting, et cetera, wardrobe. Mm -hmm. But we also had to spend an hour a day, six days a week, uh, uh, with real patients and sometimes they were very glib and told us exactly what it was like they were not necessarily being uh, mistreated it's just that the states have budgets and hospitals have budgets and there's certain things that they can afford and certain things they cannot afford uh, here's an example of people uh, good intentions going wrong now in, in washington state it, uh, uh, berries grow very well now, if, if a uh, patient wanted to sign out and go outside for a walk uh, uh, or work in the garden, they had a garden there, then they would, um, they would do so and they could go out and pick, uh, pick berries. And I was told that if you picked a little square container of, of berries, they could earn 15 cents. Uh, and that's how it was. And then one day, uh, a well-intentioned person said, well, you're, you're working them for 15 cents at a, uh, a box, a little box, uh, about the size of a, you know, a cup. And they said, no, no, they're not working. It's just something that, that they can acquire. It's not a job. They don't have to. And they said, well, you have to pay them a minimum wage if they're doing any kind of activity like that. And they said, well, it's, it's not a job. That's just what they get as a bonus. And a push came to shove, and so some lawyers got involved. They said, no, you got them. They didn't have a budget to pay them for anything like that. It was just an outdoor activity they chose to do because they wanted to do it. And I said, well, what if you don't give them anything? And so it got stupid, and what they wound up doing was taking a bulldozer and just removing the entire garden, which we thought was ridiculous. We also heard that, see, there's tunnels that go underneath the ground between the buildings and in the winter it would be very cold so if you had a procedure you had to go from your men's dorm to the women's from one building to another well you don't want to be outside and expose an exposure to the elements so there would be tunnels and we were told by the orderlies that on occasions they would throw little mixers and parties and you know you know they would keep an eye on everybody and you know they could mingle and, um it was uh uh, what would be the word? Uh, uh, chaperone is the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So we also heard, yes, that that they had performed a lobotomy while we were there, but uh, no, there were no details as to who or when or anything like that. 
Uh, next is Wes Craven's cult horror classic, The Hills Have Eyes. You've given so many great interviews about this movie, so I will touch on it briefly. The company lands at a Holiday Inn in Victorville, California in 1976. The small desert town's only culture was a Roy Rogers, Dale Evans uh, museum that moved there from Apple Valley earlier that year. The low-budget film, Blood Relations, renamed later, was shot on a Super 16 camera rented from a famous California pornographer. The the days were hot and nights were cold. There was one motor home with a broken toilet for the cast to use for makeup, wardrobe, and a place to rest. The movie becomes a cult classic. You're featured on the poster, and here we are talking about it more than 45 years later. The rumor is you and Susan Lanier would make out as a joke to break the tension while filming the scene of Brenda's brutal attack. Is the rumor true? And were human teeth used to make your hot costume? Uh, yeah, yes and yes. Uh, there, was, there was a scene when we, when I'm attacking uh, Susan, and there's a curtain, and then when uh, Mars pulls the curtain back, you know, he pulls me off and has a conversation. Well, this was a, a rehearsal, and uh, Susan was very sweet, and she said, hey, look, we're trying to break the ice and, and, and get everybody uh kind of on board with uh, like, like a you want good camaraderie when you're on a set you want everybody to get along yeah. and she said hey w wouldn't it be funny if if we, we just uh, act like we're heavily you know kissing and making out uh, just to break the tension and so we did everybody had a good laugh and, and, and it kind of brought everybody together uh, we all had a good sense of humor about uh, about the story we uh <laughs> there's, there's a scene when the fa when the father goes to see uh, Grandpa Fred at the gas station, and you know he's been uh, uh, trying to negotiate uh, some some food with Ruby Janice Blythe, and there is uh, he's all out of everything, and so she brought a bunch of stuff to border with. Well, later on, when the father shows up to see this. If you can get some help with the, uh, with the with the uh, uh, with their broken broken axle situation, he goes, what what what's all this stuff? And, and he's oh, oh oh that that's nothing. Well before that he's describing uh, 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 okay. Uh, well the father shows up and, and, and the guy goes. Uh, uh, he, he goes. He, well, he he thinks yeah. he thinks that the father is Papa Jupiter, yeah. and he uh, he, he goes. Uh, he, he shoots at him, and he goes. Well, I thought you were somebody else. Well, you always try to scare away people by you know. Uh, he has this conversation, and he says, "How's your family? Oh, they're fine. Oh, like hell, they are. There's something you ought to know." And he explains the backstory, and the father, yeah. the father's talking about how uh, Papa Jupe, when he came home, uh, the house was burnt, burnt to the ground, and I, a kid who wasn't even sentenced, I knew he'd done it, so I took a tire and I split his face wide open. And the father goes, "Well, how bad was it?" It's, well, and I said, Wes, that makes me laugh. And he goes, yeah, but that's a setup. When he says, well, what's this stuff? And you're on the phone, nothing. And then smash through the window and, and, and drag away in the beating of the father. So Wes knew how to set up the stings, is what I'm trying to say. And, and yeah. uh, we, uh, we, we, we all became friends for life. I mean, it was a wonderful experience. We, the, the, the rattlesnake was, uh, was some idiot's pet, some guy at the local bar. And um, it was a Mojave Green. I used to live out in that area. Mojave Greens are, they have cobra venom and, and neuro and muscle toxin. They're very, very dangerous. Yeah. Got loose one day uh, during lunch and uh, Janice uh, picked it up with the, the fork like she did in the movie. And uh, it was a real live snake. Uh, it was slow. Uh, guy, the guy had it in its little cage. Uh, packed with ice, but see, it was hot in the desert. So when it got warmed up, it started wiggling around. And uh, Peter Locke, uh, she went to give it to Peter Locke. He, he, uh, he had just about fainted, but uh, we had some close calls.
We asked the clubhouse, but we just were out to make a movie and we did. Uh, you were everywhere in the 1980s. In 1985, you played a mutant in the comedy My Science Project and a mutant biker in John Hughes' classic sci-fi comedy Weird Science. Do you think comedy ages better than horror, or is it the other way around? Oh, I would say they're all equal. Um, uh, a, a perfect example of uh, a comedy in a horror film that's as terrifying as uh, Evil Dead. That's a perfect example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um and you know, smoking in the boys' room, we're, we're just having fun. Uh, mm -hmm. Alf, my Alf episode, it was hilarious. You know, mm -hmm. I get my, I'm a scientist. I got him in the lab in a menag glass menagerie. That's the name of the uh, episode. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm trying to feed him celery. He goes, I don't eat celery. I eat cats. You know, uh, so he, uh, every story is a little different. Uh, I, I like comedy very much. Uh, in, in my memoir, I talk about going to Red Skelton's house because Richard was in my grammar school class and Red would come up to his son's room and uh, he'd read comic books with us and sometimes go into some of his character portrayals of uh, Gertrude and Heathcliff, the two seagulls. You know, just uh, uh, our neighbors, the Charnleys, uh, they, they had a grammar school and uh, they were very, very brilliant. It was like a Montessori type school. And uh, what that meant was it was just they had a good approach to to uh, to learning and, and, and getting children uh, excited about uh, exploration and with their mind. And because uh, I tell kids a lot, they go, uh, I mean, I meet thousands of people every year, uh, thousands. And a, a lot of the youth are, you know, they go, well, I want to be a movie star, too. And I said, look, I, I suppose I'm a movie star, but. Uh, I'm a working actor. I wound up doing this, and it was something that I could do. And some roles are uh, are significantly important, and some are just kind of throwaways or just entertainment. So you you work with what you're with what you got, and you bring this character to life for the benefit of the director and and the people telling the story. So the the fame and all of that. I mean. And I'll let them know the truth. Right? About fifty percent of all the members of the Screen Actors Guild don't even work in the course of a year. I, I forget that around sixty percent don't even make a thousand dollars a year. So, and yeah, we have the one percenters that are the multimillionaires. And you know what? That's, that's just the way it is. Some, some are tight and greedy with it, and others, like Paul Newman, set up organizations that help people. People like uh, Ashton Kutcher uh, does some wonderful charity work. So uh, people would love to have you tell the story about, oh, I drive a Ferrari. No, I don't have a Ferrari. I drive a 1986 F-250 Ford. It's all restored. It's classic. I love it. Uh, I don't want a vehicle that'll drive itself to the uh, to the dealer because uh, well here's a funny story we we were at a convention and and there was an accident so we had to drive in an opposite lane our driver was an off duty police officer this was just a few a few months ago and uh, a lot of times a local uh, car dealership will will loan out or lease out the vehicles to shuttle us actors and celebs from the hotel to the venue if it's not at the hotel. Well, we had to go against traffic. Well, the computer didn't know this. So the computer said, you're going the wrong way. And you can't talk to the computer and say, well, there's an accident. The police are telling us to go this way. And it shut the engine off and called a tow truck. Well, that could cause an accident, don't you think? I mean, bells and whistles and new technology is not that great. Uh, artificial intelligence, I think, is very, very dangerous. It has some applications, but uh, aside from Surrey or MapQuest, I, I don't see the purpose of it. Yeah. Again, it, it goes right back to the science fiction stories I read as a kid. Uh, and, and some of those futuristic films that I mentioned, uh, they're, they're cautionary tales, and they really are cautionary tales. Yeah. See, People talk about freedom and liberty and, and, and all of that. Well, if you don't have the, how can I put it? You have a right to, well, 
you have an opportunity, not a right necessarily, but you have a, you have an opportunity to be stupid. Yeah. And if you're going to be stupid, uh, the degree to which you, you cause harm or misfortune to you, yourself, your friends, or others, those degrees are are are. are uh, I'd say uh, a little checking points, footnotes to what you have or have not in the realm of, of, of humanity. You know, like there used to be a bumper sticker back in the day when it had said, the one who dies with the most toys wins. Well, that's, that's pretty lame, man. I mean, that's pretty stupid. Uh, yeah. And there's a lot of stupid out there. So, yeah. I, I recommend avoiding it and don't engage because uh, unless you're going to sit down and have a serious conversation, it's a waste of your time. You know, go to the gym, do something else, go surfing, you know, do something that you enjoy. Again, in 1985, you appear in the music videos for Motley Crue's, Motley Crue's Spoken in the Boys Room and Home Sweet Home. Spoken in the Boys Room, you mentioned earlier. Uh, do you think more songs have been written about love, lust, or heartbreak? Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, if you could I, guess, I, I, I know the guys. We we did we did the song. Mm -hmm. uh, kept in touch with them over the phone when uh, you know Mick was having issues with his arm and, and, and he was worried about being able to play. Uh, ran into events a couple of years later. Uh, I I didn't. I was not even aware of their of their work when I got. Uh, got the job for the for the video, but they were professional, delightful, fun, talented, uh, good guys, good guys. Oh, and, and one funny note: when I wiggled my ears, there was one of my questions. That's awesome. You can still do uh, it. It's just somewhere. That's, so uh, that's so fun. That's at the end of the video, yeah. and yeah. It, it was very popular for all. Uh, well over a year and then one day people were watching and, and it, the ear wiggle was cut out so people got on the phone called mtv to such an extent that somebody had to at the editing uh, studio they had they said, what do i do today fix this fix this such and such a project fix this smoking in the boys room ear wiggle reinsert three seconds so it was about three or four, uh, just a few seconds of ear wiggle that people were, it was funny, <laughs> but because they had removed it, people said, no, I want that back. So it, it's kind of fun. Yeah, I, what my next question was going to be is if you were still able to wiggle your ears, that's an awesome, that's so cool. Um, in the two thousands, you in the two thousands you've appeared in Rob Zombie's Devil's Rejects and The Lords of Salem. Then in twenty seventeen, you appear in the zombie television series Z Nation. Do you prefer fast zombies or slow zombies? Do I prefer what? Fast zombies or slow zombies? Oh, good question. Uh, <laughs> that is a good question. Um. <laughs> I'd say somewhere in between, somewhere in between, like, uh, I'm trying to think of the fog, there's, there's other stuff. Uh, I'd say a, a medium speed zombie, I think is more threatening, uh, a, a fast zombie is, you know, snatch and grab and, yeah. uh, and you're, you're in peril, peril right away. Mm -hmm. uh, now in Atlanta, they have, there's a convention that I think it's four or five hotels now. It's just huge. Uh, I went to the, one of the second ones. There's two hotels. I'm trying to uh, think of the name of it. Uh, it's a huge convention. We have a zombie walk that goes around. It goes for a couple miles, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I just appreciate uh, uh, seeing people get with the program. You know. Families come to these conventions and they're all dressed up and the kids, parents, and, and I've had a hotel guest come come to say, well, what's this? I said, here, I'll give you a pass. Walk on through, check it out. Oh, wow, oh, look what they have. They have this, they have that. And they go, what kind of people are these? I said, well, uh, you never know. Somebody in a costume, a silly costume could be a, a 
brain surgeon, a scientist, a teacher, or, you know, local police officer, or a hospice worker. You, you never know. These are educated people. I used to say if you had a library card, I'd give you a free picture. I don't do that anymore because these people are readers. Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, are quite educated. So you go, well, what's the, what's the appeal for these shows? I said, the appeal is all the stuff on the news, on your phone, on your computer, all that stuff that's not quite right in the world, it, it just clutters our head uh, to such an extent that uh, you could say it's, it's, it's demoralizing. It's, it, it's, it all comes down to it's stress. It's stress. And then when you see worldwide scenarios mm -hmm. you would never be aware of them if you weren't there or getting the worldwide scenarios news mm -hmm. so there has to I, th I think it comes down to a question of balance yeah i mean uh, you, you can't be uh, there are people that are so wound up on uh, youtube and other uh, venues for information that it's, it's just i, I think it's uh, debilitating I think it keeps you from going to the gym, keeps you from going out <laughs> to the ocean. Uh, uh, anytime I was, well, here's an example. A good friend of mine passed on years ago, Roddy Roddy Piper, the wrestler, a very good friend of mine. We worked together on a project with Glenn Larson. And when he needed to just chill out, he, he he had some property in Oregon in the middle of the property it was a mountain and every morning he would just, he would run up to the top of his mountain sit and watch the sunrise with his two dogs so there's a time to uh, how do you get re, uh, grounded and I would say uh, go into nature they say dust to dust we're, you know we're just a you know, pile of dirt with a breath of energy and life okay fine we don't take it with us so what does that mean uh i say it's, it's good to f feel the earth beneath your feet so this last question is a sophie's choice two must die so that one may live the original twilight zone series all the film and television shows of T star trek or the film blade runner two must die so that one may live so out of the three, I get to choose. Yeah, my it's favorite. One. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh man, well, that's a tough choice. Uh, <laughs> boy, because there's there's there are moments in time. I had that memorized one time. Uh, boy, I'll have to go with Blade Runner. <laughs> for the simple reason when he says his soliloquy when he when he dies yeah. i i had it i had it to memory and i was having dinner with rutger Hauer, and i i did that scene and the smile on his face was just uh wonderful and it's it, it has such a profound message. It, it, in a way, it, it encapsulates everything that Rod Serling did thematically uh, and and uh, um, uh, ethically. And again, Star Trek ethics, the human condition, all of that. Uh, I would say that Rutger Howard's, uh, I would say that Blade Runner is like a door that opens you into a wider realm that would include all the Star Trek and all of the Twilight Zone. It's, it's an entry point into a, a, a wonderful universe of which we are uh, we're all a part of. Um, thank you for sitting with me. Is there anything you want to ask me before we're done? Um, yeah, how did you get started and what you do? Because uh, I, I, I see the uh, posters uh, <laughs> on the wall, and uh, uh, I want to say next to my memoir, is, is that from the uh, storyteller? Which one? Uh, the gray one, the gray head. 
No, this is a. I'm here. I'll, I'll grab him. Oh, it, it's very close to what Andrew Getty did. Okay, it's, uh, the teeth. It's the teeth are different. Yeah. Um. It's. Uh. I. I think it's the vampire from Salem's Lot. Uh. I. But okay. I, I. I don't think it is. Like I don't think that's specifically what it is. It's. Um. He's from the office of Howard Berger from Canby Studios. Uh, wow, it was a cool. gift from Howard Berger. That's very. Uh, I had interviewed him before. That's very cool. Yeah, the uh, it reminded me of the uh, Andrew Getty's only film. It's called The Evil Within, but uh, my character looks similar to that. And the last thing I want to say is uh, thank you very much. For, uh, I mean, you're, you're uh, probably one of the best uh, interviews uh, I've ever done. Yeah, you're knowledgeable. You're thorough. Uh, uh, I, again, thank you for the invite and thank you for uh, getting the word out because uh, no problem. I'm self publishing. And, and uh, you just go to Amazon, you'll get it in a couple of days. It's a very, very good read. And uh, <laughs> Stubborn Me said, No, this is my story. <laughs> I'm going to tell it my way. I'm not going to tell it the way that. Uh, some other people wanted me to do it because yeah. it's a memoir. It's not a biography with all the trials and tribulations of you know shocking news. No, it's about yeah. the boy. So yeah. again, uh, enjoy your life, and uh, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, the book is called "It's All Good: A Memoir in My Own Words." Again, purchase your copy from MichaelBearman.com or. Find it on Amazon. I just, highly go straight, just go straight to Amazon. Yeah, go straight to Amazon. I highly Amazon. recommend it to my audience, and I'm looking forward to part two coming soon. I, I am too. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you very much.